See, brethren, enjoying time together. And that's a big part of what gospel meetings are, getting to be together and encourage each other. We've been enjoying this meeting, for those of you who've been. Amen? Amen. It's been really good. It's been a feast on God's Word. We're thankful to have our brother Alan Webster with us. He's been preaching the gospel for many years, and he's also an instructor in the Memphis School of Preaching. And uh, those who've been already, times past, you've already heard me say it, but uh, he was preaching in Jacksonville, Alabama, at the congregation where I met my wife. And so that means something to me personally. And I always enjoyed hearing him preach when I'd go visit her before we got married. And I also enjoyed hearing him when I was growing up. He preached and came to our home congregation. That, that means a lot to me. I, I like keep on saying that because it really does mean a lot to me. And there are people here that you have those preachers that encouraged you and taught you that you appreciate so much. Tonight, leading in our services, our songs will be led by Jeremy Beard. Opening prayer, uh, our own here at Washington Avenue, Jeremy Beard. Our opening prayer by Mark Weston. Mark, if you don't know, he serves as an elder at Harrisburg Church. Closing prayer will be led tonight by Josh Alexander. He serves and labors preaching and teaching at the Foothills Church in Searcy. We're glad to have him and some folks with him from Searcy. And there are other visitors from other areas uh, that are not members here. We're happy that you came and glad that you're with us. So let's build each other up in song and prayer and in the hearing of God's word tonight. Let's begin. Number 353. 353. We have heard. Before our prayer, we'll sing number 757. 757.
bow with me, please. Fathers, we bow our head before you tonight. We are so grateful for the beautiful, beautiful day you blessed us with. We're so fortunate, Father, to be among the number of the saved tonight. We're grateful for this opportunity that we have to, to come and to sing songs of praise to you, to open your word and to glean from its pages the things that you would have us to know as we strive to live for you. Father, help us all to understand the so very importance of the souls of men. Help us as we strive to understand evangelism and the need to take the word to the lost, how truly important it is for us to do our part. Help us to have hearts that understand. Help us to have the love within our hearts that you have for us. Help us to care for those that are lost. Father, as Brother Allen continues to bring your message to us, we pray, Father, that you would help him as he recollects the thoughts that he's prepared for us. Help us, Father, as listeners to, to be able just for a moment tonight to put all of our cares and our worries and our concerns, our daily routines out of our mind. Help us to focus on your word. Help us to understand that as we open the Bible, it's not just another good book. It's your word to us. And help us to open our hearts to it and be receptive so that we can share it with others. Continue to be with us as we worship you tonight. Be with Jeremy as he leads us in our singing. Help us all, Father, to focus on the words that we sing together and offer, up, offer them up to you with all the love and reverence that we have for you as our God and our creator. Forgive us, Father, when we fail you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able to, let's stand as we sing number 399. 399. I just want to remind our alto singers, um, in the cor beginning of the chorus in this song, you have the lead, and at the very beginning, you will be the only one singing for the first few words there. So come in strong where we can hear you, and say, don't be afraid to sing out. <clears throat>
Be seated, please. The invitation song will be number 538, 538. The average Church of Christ is 58 years old, has just under 80 members, There are 1,636 Churches of Christ, though, that are over 100 years old. The average church plant, um, about 65% of church plants last over four years. And the last records that I was able to, to read says that 86 Churches of Christ closed their doors in the last year. You could tell, tell me a lot of things that would make me sad, but I don't think you would find anything that makes me sadder than that last statement. I had supper with uh, an elder in Georgia about four years ago. And he said something that has been on my mind ever since. He is an elder in a small congregation. And he said, we were talking about, he asked, how can we build up the church? And he said, I don't want the church to go down on my watch. I've talked to him recently, and his heart is still right there. There are several congregations represented here tonight, and I don't know where you may be from. I want to ask you a couple of introspective questions, though. <clears throat> How many members attended Sunday where you worshiped? How many were there 10 years ago from last Sunday, if you were a member there? And is the trend up or down? And may I ask your judgment on where the church where you worship will be in 10 years from now, if the Lord delays his coming? Are we going in the right direction? Will we be thriving, surviving, or somewhere in the middle? You know, these are hard questions to ponder. But if we don't ask hard questions, we don't do great things. And if we don't ask the hard questions, then somebody's going to look around one day and say, there used to be a Church of Christ here. I remember when. The time to address that is now. The gospel is just as powerful tonight as it was when the apostles went out in that first generation with it. It is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1.16. God has not got grown old and weak in the last 2,000 years. He is just as powerful tonight as he has ever been. God does not change. The church is just as valuable tonight as it ever was. Salvation is just as real in the church tonight as it was for those who responded on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. They were saved. We are saved. It's the same verb and it's the same meaning. We are saved from sin to live eternally with God in heaven. The message that we carry out to the world is the right message. It's the only message that will save a human soul from a devil's hell. It's the only message for one made in the image of God that fits and that will transmit that person into the image of Christ. So we're talking about evangelism, which is the lifeblood of the church. Where will the church be in 10 years? It mostly depends on the faith of the members. 
Am I happy with the status quo? Live and let live. Don't rock the boat. Come and sit and hear the sermon and tell the preacher you did a good job and put in my check and go home. And Or is there more to it than that? I wonder if the difference is not between a John 3.16 Christian and a Galatians 2.20 Christian. Have you ever contrasted those two verses? Now, we know John 3.16. For God so loved the world. It's easy to get lost in the aggregate. That's a lot of people. That's a big word. The world. Well, that's everybody. The same truth is taught in Galatians 2.20, but not in the same way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Do you remember the last part of it? By the faith what? of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see the difference in a John 3.16 Christian? God loves everybody. The aggregate, the general. And in Galatians 2.20 Christian, he died for me. It's got to be personal. Until it's, pers until it's personal, it's not real. But it's real when Jesus died for me. I had a teacher in college that used to say, and I heard him say this several times, and I've, I've preached it before. I think it's the truth. He said, I believe that Jesus loved me enough that if I had been the only person God ever made, Jesus would have come to the earth and died for me. When that gets a hold of me, it changed my life. He died for me. We're going to ask three questions tonight. Each one has, well, the first two have three answers, and the last one has four. First question is, <clears throat> what am I willing to risk for the church to grow, for souls to be saved? What am I willing to risk? I read uh, something from Dr. Bob Cox, who was at one time involved in the university system, the uh, education system in the University of Texas school system. He did a study, it wasn't particularly a religious study, but it had, it, part of it pertained to religion. What he learned, well, what he studied and learned is that movements have three phases. Churches have the same three phases. Number one is the risk taking stage. Somebody decides, we'll plot to a church, somebody says there should be a church in our town. We're having to drive 45 minutes or some number. Uh, we, we ought to have a congregation here. And so he begins to talk to his family. I agree with us having, and then some friends, and then there's three families, they get together, and, and they, they say, well, you know, if we're going to have a, a congregation here, we're going to have to get out and let people know about it. So they, they begin to pass out flyers, and they go door to door, and they're talking. They take a radio ad out, and they pay, he pays for it from his own pocket, and and before long, they, they've got another family coming and then another, and they're putting their money in. And somebody says, you know, we can't meet in our basement anymore. We really need to have a place to meet. We could, we could really grow more. So let's see if we can rent a storefront. So they all, and they all have to chip in a little bit more, but they get that storefront. They put up a sign. And then they grow some, and that's, that's their life. They talk about it. They live it. They think about it. They pray about it. It's they're risking their money, their time, their name. And then that church eventually builds a building. And they've got a good number of members, and they select elders and deacons, and they've, they're recognized as one of the churches in town. And Dr. Cox said that the second phase of a movement is 
caretaking. Let's just, you know, we've arrived. Let's just, don't rock the boat. Uh, we're comfortable. It's, it's, it's the way we, we like it. So that church gets to the point where uh, maybe you don't preach quite so strongly as you used to. You might offend somebody. Third stage, undertaking. Risk-taking, caretaking, undertaking. Somebody says, you know, it's got to where I have to lead a prayer every Sunday because there's not enough men left. And then, this hurts me to say, but I'm going to say it because we're just being real. Heard about a church recently said, we got enough money to last seven more months. No, you don't. You don't even have enough faith to last seven more months. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. That's your father. He's rich. <laughs> For that matter, he owns the hills under a thousand cattle because he owns the whole earth. So that's Psalm 51, 10 to 12, and Psalm 1. Uh, Psalm 24, 1. <clears throat> where is the church where I am? Risk-taking, caretaking, undertaking. Now, the good thing about this is we can reverse the clock. We can go back to risk-taking, even from the undertaking stage, because the church started with just a few people who are all in, and how many do we have now? Well, if it's only a few people, we've got what we started with. Do we have the same attitude? So risk-taking. There are three risks that I'm being asked to take. Am I willing to risk, number one, my reputation? John 12, 42, there were those among the chief rulers who believed in Jesus, but they would not confess him. Lest the Pharisees cast them out. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now that was a problem back then, but that can be a problem in my life. Don't give any indication about this answer. And I think I know the answer. You're here on a Tuesday night, you know. <laughs> but uh, do the people where you work know where you go to church? Can I, can I use that colloquialism? Well, so far I've been able to hide it. No, 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 no. <laughs> don't hide it, you know. I can't ever get them to come if they don't know, I, you know. My friends, how wide is the circle that knows that I'm a Christian? And my, somebody says, well, if I, if I talk to my friend about a Bible study, she might get upset with me. I might not have my friend. Or if I talk to my mom or my brother or my cousin, whoever, it might affect the relationship. And I don't know if, am I willing to risk my relationship? You know the apostles, this is in 1 Corinthians 4. It's really a larger context, but we'll just focus on verse 13. And really only one word there. The whole verse is about reputation. But that one word I, wanna, I want to focus on is, did you know this word's in the Bible? Off-scouring. That's King James. Uh, you've probably never had this experience, but... Some of us, call, some, some college students know about this, and I remember it. <laughs> you know that, uh, that ring around the tub? <laughs> you know, where you scrub, maybe you get some kind of strong cleanser, and you, well, what do you call that? Off scouring. Paul said, that's the way I feel. 
That's the way the world looks at us apostles. Did they have any reputation left? Well, they gave it to the Lord. Remember last night, I'll do things for Jesus I won't do for anybody else. Jesus, you can have my reputation if it makes yours better. Luke 9.23, speaking, uh, speaking to one, thinking about becoming a follower of Jesus. The first thing, let him that follows me deny himself. Think of his cross and follow me. Self, first thing is self-denial. What was that Galatians 2.20 again? I am crucified with Christ. Crucifixion means, crucifixion always ends in death, every time. You didn't take anybody alive off a tree. It's always a death. I'm crucified with Christ means I died. Dead men have no feelings. Dead men have no reputation. Dead men give it to the Lord. Number two. Am I willing to risk persecution. Read with, with me in your Bible. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. I've been thinking about this on the way over here. 2 Corinthians 11. <laughs> I've thought about this before. You may have too. Uh, let me just think about Paul uh, with you for a minute. Uh, Paul was converted when he was probably 37, 38. He had been a persecutor of the church. He became persecuted for the church. You could say that Paul, when he converted, he started sprinting for heaven, and he never slowed down till they killed him. For, he, he, he carried the gospel 12,000 miles. He preached on three continents. He established a score of congregations, probably baptized thousands of people. He spent two years in prison, at least. But let's read about it. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. Are they ministers of Christ? He's contrasting himself with the false teachers that were accusing and castigating the apostles himself. I speak as a fool. I'm more. And he says, I, he'll say this later. I hate to do this. I hate to brag. But I'm just going to, I need to tell you so you can contrast what we, we have a saying, uh, the proof is in the pudding. You know that saying? So that's what he's saying here. He said, the proof's in the pudding. I have sacrificed for my faith. My faith is real. What have they sacrificed? So this is what he puts on the table as his offering. He says, uh, I am more. I'm in uh, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. The last part means I, I didn't know if I'd live or die a lot of times uh, in life and death situations often. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. So five times four, that's 200 minus five, 195 stripes. If you had seen Paul without his shirt on, seen his back, it would have just been a big scar. 195 stripes. Each one's like that. How much space is there back there? He had stripes on top of stripes. Thrice I was beat marauds. Bad to get whipped, but it's worse to get beat marauds. And he said, they did that to me three times. Once I was stoned. Well, that's Lystra, Luke, uh, Acts 14. You know what stoning was? They took somebody out. Sometimes they would cast them over like a ledge, and they would throw rocks down on them, or they'd just push them down and throw. And so the person would try to cover their head, of course, and they would just keep throwing rocks at them until they passed out, and then until they quit breathing. And there were multiple people participating in stoning a person. 
So what happened in this case? They threw so many rocks at Paul until he passed out, and they thought he was dead because they quit stoning him. Then they went back to the city, and he revived, and he got up, and he walked back into the city. <laughs> and he visited the brethren who thought he was dead, and then he left. Paul had guts. Paul was one tough guy. They left him for dead, but they didn't kill him. And you know what? He didn't say, well, I dodged a bullet that time. I preached my last sermon. I can tell you that. I learned my lesson. No, he just went to the next city and started preaching all over again. <laughs> a night and a day, I've thrice I suffered shipwreck. I'm not sure I would want to get on a ship with Paul. Uh, three times his ship went down, right? Well, there, there was one of the captains, you know, the Moby Dick story. Have you read uh, Philip Hamrick's book about, they discovered, anyway, it's too much information, but uh, that's, a, that's based on a true story out of Nantucket. And the uh, guy that was the captain of it, he survived. And so he tried to be a captain, and he took another ship out, he went down too. You know what? Nobody would trust him in their ship anymore. <laughs> so he became a night watchman in Nantucket. That was his job. Well, Paul, got, Paul went down three times. A night and a day I've been in the deep. How long could you swim? I doubt I could swim a whole day. A day and a night, Paul said, somehow I Maybe he got a hold of a piece of the ship or something, but he was in the deep at night and a day. Okay, there's more there, but that's all I'm going to read because this is the point. Sometimes I think, boy, I got it bad. <laughs> oh, I got it rough. Somebody looked at me askance, <laughs> you know, or somebody said something to me that wasn't very nice, or they don't want to be my friend anymore. And then I read that and I say, I got nothing to complain about. <laughs> so here's the question. What am I willing to risk? Am I willing to risk my reputation? Am I willing to risk persecution? Am I willing to risk, risk my life? Acts 15, uh, 26, speaking of Paul, and this has, includes Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul. Acts 15, 26, it's, it, they are described as men who hazarded their lives for the gospel, put their lives on the line. I was preaching on gospel, uh, gospel many years, some years ago. And someone invited me over to their house. Uh, I had known the guy a little bit before through PTP, but I didn't know him well. I didn't know his wife at all. But I went out there, and he owned a farm. Was, you know, down this dirt road between all these fields, and here's a little country house. Went in, had, had a good, good supper. We started talking. Now, I'd known him well enough to know that he had some health problems. I didn't know why or what, but he had lost a good bit of weight. And he didn't look healthy. And as we were eating and talking, he, he explained what happened to him. He said, I've been going over, I think it was Africa, for the last 10 years. He said, I'm a farmer. He's not a preacher, he's a farmer. He said, but I go over there and I teach them how to farm and make a living and I teach the gospel on there. He said, the last trip I was on, or next to the last trip I was on, when I got home, I, didn't, I wasn't feeling good. And I got really sick and went to the doctor, and they sent me the disease, disease specialist. He said, I got something, and they can't figure out what it is. He said, if they don't find out, I'm going to die. You know what he was planning to do? go back to Africa, 
on a mission trip. I don't know if he's alive right now. But I know where we'll see him one day. He said, my life's his. If I can use it for his kingdom, I'll use it. Second question. What am I willing to sacrifice? It's a different question. First, there's three, three answers to that. First one is, am I willing to sacrifice my comfort? When Isaiah was called, uh, this is in Isaiah 6, the Lord asked a question. Who will go for me? And whom shall we send? <laughs> Isaiah said, here am I. You know this? Here am I, send me. Pick me, pick me. I want to go. Pick me. Here am I, send me. Jesus is saying, who will go for me? Tonight. Uh, pick him. <laughs> you know? Lord, pick me. Pick me. I want to go. Let me go. That means I'm willing to risk my comfort. I'm willing to sacrifice my comfort. You know, we all have our routines. We like to come in from work or school and do what we do and Maybe it's Facebook, or maybe it's Sports Center, or maybe it's jogging. I don't know. Whatever it is, right? Am I willing to give up my routine, my comfort zone, to see the church grow, to see souls saved? We talked last night about the frequency of evangelism, you know, day, week, month, quarter, year. You know, if you do that, it's going to interrupt routine. It's going to interrupt comfort zone. So if I have a Bible study every week, that's going to get very regular, very quick. But it's worth it. You know when it's worth it? Not when they canceled on you for the second time. And I rearranged my schedule and now they didn't. That happens. Yeah. You know when it's worth it? When you're sitting right here watching the person you've been teaching for the last three weeks or six weeks go down in the water and seeing that look on his or her face when they come out of, I'm guessing it's men on one side and women on the other side, maybe. Anyway, when they come out of that door and they say, thank you. <laughs> and you know, when you go back out that door, you're like, who's, who's next? I want to teach somebody else. But I can't stay comfortable and do that. Am I willing to give up my comfort? Number two. Am I willing to give up my time? You might not be like this, but some people in this room are like this. I don't know you personally. I just know crowds. I know people, right? It's like, you, you need something? I'll give you some money toward it, but I'm too busy to get involved in it, right? I'll make a donation, but I can't. I don't have time to do it. Let me help you do it. That's okay. Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeeming the time for the days are evil. Use time wisely. Totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I've had that happen before. I've been up, I've been up preaching, and somebody called me. And my phone wasn't on silent, and I was like, "Uh, is that you?" <laughs> um, oh yeah. Uh, it's the the wisest way to use time is to learn to use it backwards. What will be important to me when when life's over? I can tell you, I've been there with people, right? You, you may have been there with people. Preachers are there. 
I've been in the hospital when the death rattle was in the throat of church members. I've been with people when they died. I was with my dad. I mentioned this in gospel meeting at Broad Street. And he died slowly because he had a brain tumor. <clears throat> so we had nine months together. We talked a lot. I saw it with him. But I've seen it with others. And this will be true with you and me when we get there. There are three things that are important at the end of life. My relationship with God. Am I ready? My family that I'm leaving behind, are they ready to be without me? And the local church. Who's going to do what I do? Is the church going to be okay? That includes the souls that I'm trying to bring to Christ. Now, if that's what's important at the end of life, shouldn't it be important over here? So many things we do every day, and no matter much, if any. But I tell you what will matter. People I've led to Christ, or people that I could have led to Christ. I want to use my time for the most good, since only a little bit. And I figured this up on the way over here last night. I forgot to say this. So the average life spans about 75 years. It's a little bit over that, especially for women, but that's a good round number, 75 years. You will live about 29,000 days. About 900 months. No, 3,900 months. No, 3,900 weeks and 900 months. 3,900 and 900. And I figured it out for the frequency thing. So the quarters, 300. But let's just talk about the 29,000 days for just, just a minute. Now, don't do this during my sermon because this might not be encouraging. <laughs> but this is how I could figure out. I mean, it's common sense, right? So uh, how many birthdays have I had times 365, whatever that number is? Subtracted from 29,000. And that number is theoretically how many more days I have to give God. Now, you might live to be, you might have 32,000 days. You might have 36, you won't have more than 36,000 days probably, but some number, you, but it's going to be pretty close to 29,000. <clears throat> when is a day more valuable? When you're Ross's age or when you're Wayne's age? The same. Or when you're, what's your name? Case, what is it? Cason, that's right, Cason. I met Cason before. Is it more valuable when you're Cason's age, Ross's age, or Wayne's age? It's a trick question. It's the same. We just don't know it until we get to be Wayne's age, usually, you know? But whatever age it is, I want to do something. Um, I love history, so I love stories from history. So uh, when Napoleon was planning his um, battles, he was working at a table with his generals, and he took his fingernail and he scratched across the table and left a mark. And he looked each of his generals in the face and he said, I want to leave a mark in the world like that. I want to leave a mark in the world, don't you? Not like that. I want to leave 
Augustus Caesar. It's one of my favorite quotes from history. Um, <clears throat> said, I found Rome a city of bricks and I left it a city of marble. What does that mean? I left it better than I found it. So, the local congregation where I'm a member, I want to leave it better than I found it. I want to leave it better for my kids than it was when I was a kid. I want to leave the church in better shape. How do I do that? Evangelism. Bringing. Teaching. Keeping. I want the church to help. Boy, this church is terrible. You got no clock, and now you don't even have a numbers board. I mean... And this is probably not even a true church. I'm not sure. Uh, where, anyway, somebody, you, you got one at your church building, I hope, those of you who are visiting here, right? So you know how I many people were there last Sunday, right? I don't think there's one out in the foyer, actually, but uh, I can't see it. <clears throat> okay, that number, whatever it was last Sunday, I hope that number's bigger when you leave this world than it is right now. That should be our goal. We want the church to be in better shape. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. the thing, things that I have taught you, teach others, give to faithful men also. Give God time. Number three, am I willing to sacrifice money? That's Hebrews 10.34 through 39, but 34 says that they had willingly suffered the confiscation of their goods. They had not yet suffered under blood, so they weren't beating them, but they were taking their property. And, they, and, and if Paul's writer of Hebrews, that, that's what I believe, if Paul, wrote, if Paul wrote, whoever wrote Hebrews said, you were, you were fine with that. Well, yeah, you can have that. It's just stuff. <laughs> you know? That's us. Why did God give me money in the first place? To do good, well, to support me, and to do good with it. Be good with it. Let's move on to number four, number third question. How much am I willing to care? There's actually four questions, and we talked about the first one already, but I just want to balance this up for you, those of you taking notes. How involved am I willing to get? What am I willing to risk? What am I willing to sacrifice? How much am I willing to care? Two what's, two, two how's. There are four levels of, of love. And it really comes down to this. Because everything that we said so far, if, it won't matter at all unless this one. This is the focus. Because everything in Christianity comes out of love. There are four levels of love. The first level of love, actually, we learn about in hell. This is one... <laughs> Um, you remember in Luke 16, there's a story about the rich man Lazarus. And the rich man lift, be, lifted up his eyes being in torments, and he said, send Lazarus over to dip his, t dip his finger in water and cool my tongue from tormenting this flame. And Abraham said, no, he can't. He can't come over there. There's a great gulf fix between the two, and he can't pass over. And then the rich man said, well, send him back to earth. I got five brothers. And warn them about this place. And Abraham said, no. They got, they got Moses and the prophets. They, they got the Bible. And the rich man's like, no, no, I had that. <laughs> and I ended up here. He didn't say that, but that's his attitude. But then Abraham said, if they won't be persuaded by... Moses and the prophets. They won't be persuaded though one rose from the dead. This book is powerful. Now, I said all that just to refresh your memory so I could make this, draw this point out of it. But the point is, he got concerned for his brothers once he couldn't influence them anymore. He was, that's the first level of love. Concern. Do, do I care? that people are lost. 
Well, Christianity begins with concern, with love. Second level is the level of tears. And Luke 19, 41 records that Jesus sat over against the city and he wept. Why did he weep? He said, I, I've called you and you wouldn't come. Like a, a he, I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. He said, I wish. He said, I came down from heaven to earth. I want to save you. I want you to listen. I want you to learn. I want you to be saved. Eh, um, he wept. Now, this the word that's translated wept there is not it's not a little tear out of the corner of the eye, kind of, you know, like you're at a movie and you're watching it. It's like, <laughs> you know. Now, this is, the, this is sobbing as a little child. I mean, it's losing control kind of weeping. Jeremiah says, oh, oh, that my eyes were rivers, that I might weep for the slain of the daughter of my people. Jeremiah 9.1. Paul said that he had been in Ephesus with tears, Acts 20, 27. I tell you now, even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, Philippians 3, 18. I remember, I never met Gus Nichols. Gus Nichols died in 1975. But there's hardly a week that went by when I was growing up, and even since I've been a, a preacher, I don't hear Gus Nichols' name. He preached in Alabama, the Sixth Avenue Church, and I have preached there for 47 years. I've been to his grave. It's right in the front of the cemetery. The, the cemetery owner was not a member of the church, but he loved Brother Nichols so much, and Brother Nichols was so well known. He said, I'm going to give you this spot right here in the front of the cemetery. It's like a big circle. Um, Brother Nichols was preaching somewhere, like a gospel meeting. And, and the preacher took him around and said, I want to show you around town. So he said, I want to show you the nice houses. There's a really nice community here. So he took him over to where the big houses were and he's driving up. He said, this one probably cost a million dollars right there. In fact, maybe all these do. And then in, in a minute, he noticed Brother Nichols wasn't saying anything. And he looked over at him and he was crying. He said, Brother Nichols, what's wrong? He said, I was just thinking it'll be hard to reach these people with the gospel. Third level is a level of sweat. We mentioned the four friends of the paralyzed man in Mark 4. I guess they were sweating by the time they broke that roof up and let him down. But they wouldn't stop until they got him what he needed. So, John 9, 4, I must work while it is day for the night come with no man can work. It takes work to build a church. It takes effort. It takes, I'm going to, I'm going to have to give of my energy for it. The fourth level is what I call the ultimate level. I've not ever reached this level. And maybe none of us has. But it's the Romans... 9-3 level, where Paul says, I could wish myself a curse from Christ that I might save my people. I'm talking about the Jews, my kinsmen according to the flesh. If I'm understanding that verse right, right, he's saying, I would go to hell if, if I could take the place of the Jews. I've never been there. But I'll tell you this. If somebody loves somebody else enough to go to hell for them, you can't stop him. You'll never stop him. Because you can't love somebody more than that. Yeah. 
I want to just end this lesson tonight by reminding us of the joy of entering into heaven. I just want you to think about that song we sometimes sing when my, my bark reaches the eternal shore, like the boat comes in. I don't know how to be, but I can imagine as, as the boat that I'm on, in, and I see the city a lot up there and the crossing over to the other side, and then I, I get there. You know, we went on a cruise one time, and uh, they stop you before you get on the boat, at least on this one. And they said, announcing the Webster family. And you walk on the boat. Can you imagine what it would be like? An angel says, announcing Parker. Let me tell you another joy. When, when the boat hits the bank and the people are there that rush over and say, thank you. Thank you. I'm here because of you. Oh, that'll be worth all the tears, sweat, blood, whatever it took one of these days, and to hear those words, none of that's as sweet as this. When Jesus calls us up. Have you ever thought about 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 before? It says, every man shall have praise of God. That doesn't say every man shall praise God. That's true too. But that's not what that verse says. That verse says every man shall have praise of God. On the judgment day, when you come up and you're one of the faithful, let me introduce you to my daughter. And he gives your name. Let me tell you, she brought these 17 people in her lifetime to my kingdom. She suffered persecution. She never denied my name. Can you imagine the Lord praising you? And you would turn and praise Him. Do you have a do you, do you have your name written in the book of life? So I don't, I don't really know. Okay. Well, this is how you know. Because whenever a person obeys the gospel, that is, they have their sins forgiven, God writes their that person's name in his book, it's the Heaven's Roll Call book, as one of his children because he adopts us at that point. So you can know if this is true of you. Have you been baptized for the remission of your sins? Acts 2.38. Now, if not, then you could do that tonight, but you can only, not, any, not everybody can be baptized scripturally. These things have to be true before you can. But perhaps they are true. One is that you know about Jesus Christ that he's the son of God, that he lived and died, resurrected the third day, Romans 10, 17, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3. That you believe Jesus Christ is the son of God. Do you believe that tonight? If so, third question, have you repented of sin? Repentance means I changed my mind about it. I'm not living for sin anymore. I'm living for him. That's Luke 13, 3. Would you be willing to confess him tonight? To say before these people in this room, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then from this day forward, be willing to say it to anybody and everybody the rest of your life. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 9, and 10. If those four things are true of you, you could be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. You won't see it happen. But when you come up out of that water, God gets his pen out and writes your name. Have you ever thought about this? The name your mama and daddy gave you when you were born will be written in heaven. 
that name. And then he will one day read it out. You're invited to do that tonight. Acts 2.38, for the mission of sins. If you haven't been a faithful Christian, say, I want to be restored tonight. Let me, well, let's, let us pray for you, put with you. I don't, I'm not asking you to do this, so don't do it. But if I did ask, who in here has ever responded to the invitation and asked for the prayers of the church? It'd be a lot of us. It'd be a lot, of, it, it'd be me, for sure. You say, really? A lot of people. If you need forgiveness, then ask for it. If you need prayer, then ask for it. Nobody in the Judgment Day line ever said, I wish I hadn't gone forward. <laughs> There'd be a whole lot of people say, I wish I had. So tonight's an opportunity. And you may come while we stand, Mom.